Now, taking this opportunity, we start to invite other speakers to talk. First, we need someone to inform us what China is now doing. And I find the best way is to get them from the Energy Investment Committee under China Investment Association, in which this young lady, Ms. Hei So Xiao, Shao Siyang Yu Si, the Deputy Secretary General, will be a suitable person <coughs> to give you a full picture. I met this young lady many years ago when she just got her master's degree in Peking University, Beijing Dashu. That is also known as Beijing University. Highly recommended by the Dean of Environment after I deliver my speech in a conference called the certification. This is a funny word. Uh, it, which means fighting against deserts. But why not de desertification? I have been watching her to grow so fast as you can check her brief bio in the booklet to find out in detail what has she done in such a short period of time, <laughs> including writing two books uh, carbon finance and carbon trade, and she's now the CEO of Gu Lung Capital, Gu Lian Zibin as well. Please listen to her talk, introducing the development of hydrogen economy and the prospective development in China. So here is Hei So Xiao, who will answer questions after her speech, and then she has to go back to another conference in China to speak again. Ladies and gentlemen, Hei So Xiao. Hi, Dominic. Thank you for your introduction. And good afternoon, ladies Louder, and gentlemen. Uh, can you hear me? Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. So um, uh, I'm going to talk about the status and the prospects of hydrogen industry in China. But uh, first of all, I'm not a scientist or a technical expert. I've been doing carbon trade in China for over 10 years. So I'm more like a carbon expert. But uh, since 2016, I've been doing studies and researches about hydrogen industry and mostly specifically hydrogen as a, as a kind of energy and how the local governments, some of the local governments can support the development of hydrogen hydrogen development in China. So uh, I'm going to talk about my views and some of my personal views and uh, uh, thoughts on this industry. First of all, I would like to touch some basis on or repeat on China's 3020s uh, goal because we all know that uh, carbon is the hot, might be the hottest word in China this year, just because uh, the, in last September, on last September 2022, 20, President Xi Jinping announced that China will try to achieve uh, a carbon peaking by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. Among uh, many of the countries in the world who have also pledged a carbon neutrality goal last year. So uh, it's people say that uh, we are living in the 21st century. It's a carbon neutrality century because most of the major economies will achieve carbon neutrality in this century. Uh, so according to ECIU, there are already like 
uh, more than 60 countries who have been written carbon neutrality goal in their legislation or policy document, including China. So the 30, uh, 60 goal is a big challenge for China as the biggest developing nation in the world, because if we compare China with other uh, major economies like EU, like EU has uh, EU's goal from carbon peaking to neutrality will take 71 years. US will take 43 years. Japan will be like 37 years. But for China, we are going to achieve neutrality 30 years after peaking. So so-called like it's it's a, it's it's non uh, it's, it's a historical record because we are going to use the shortest term to reduce the biggest volume of carbon emissions. Because by the time of 2030, when China is picking its carbon emissions, our the total emissions of the country may reach like the last year, China's carbon emissions about is about 10 billion tons of greenhouse gases. So by picking, China may be achieved like 20 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So it's, it has no one in the history or in the upcoming future can do that. So how, the, how will China to achieve its carbon neutrality goal? Uh, this is my own roadmap. It's not, it's not written in any kind of central policy, but I think uh, my experience and background in China's energy sector may have some saying in that. So first of all, to achieve a carbon neutrality, China needs to decarbonize its power generation, the electricity sector. So so-called wind, so, uh, hydro, solar PV, all kinds of renewable energy sources. However, to achieve a, a a new energy uh, or electricity structure centered or dominated by uh, renewable, we need more viable uh, options to storage the renewable energy. Then that's, that's something hydrogen can play a very significant role in. And also for the end users, for the energy consumption, first of all, China should electrify as much as possible, it's end, it's, it's end use energy consumption. So for building sector, most of the buildings have already been electrified, which means very little use of fossil fuels, uh, maybe more uh, in the Northern, uh, in North China for, for heating, there are still some kind of fossil fuel use, uh, use in heating uh, of the, for, for the buildings. But for, uh, and for the transportation sector, electric vehicles have already been booming in China in the last decade. However, there are still some uh, uh, some areas in transportation uh, that can have not been have not yet been electrified, such as the long distance uh, commercial vehicles, for, uh, for example, the heavy duty trucks. Uh, that the fuel cell vehicles can play a role, and also for the uh, aviation and long distance shipping, it's very hard or difficult to be electrified. And for the energy efficiency, that which actually that means uh, reduce the energy consumption for in uh, in the end use side, but hydrogen can still play something uh, significantly in energy efficiency. Uh, that's mostly like the uh, fuel cell based combined heating and power. It can be used in some major uh, building sectors such as the IDC, the Internet Data Centers and hospitals or other public buildings and hybrid heat pump and boilers also for buildings. For those industry sectors that can not be electrified or very costly to be electrified, uh, the, uh, the decarbonization options will also include hydrogen use in certain uh, in intensive emission sectors such as steel. Steel can use hydrogen Direct, uh, direct reducing iron and also the hydrogen enriched compressed and natural gas and green chemical such as the ammonia or methanol production can use the green hydrogen to replace or to substitute the uh, traditional fossil fuels. 
So let's say that, that means for, for the, in, in my roadmap to achieve China's carbon neutrality, for every section or for every area, hydrogen can play a role. And hydrogen, well, it's, I think nowadays there, are, there is already a hydrogen hype because it's more, it's something like uh, electric vehicles about 10 years ago, like um, every, every industry or uh, investors are keen on hydrogen investment. So there are SOEs uh, dedicated into hydrogen. Uh, by, by July of this year, uh, there are already more than one third of state-owned enterprises in China who have been planning on hydrogen development, including production, storage, uh, hydrogen refueling stations, or hydrogen application in certain sectors. They are not only, they are not only like uh, the uh, traditional energy companies, for example, the Shenhua, but it's now have renamed like National Energy Group, but also oil and gas companies uh, like Petrol China and Sanopec, which both very actively participated in the hydrogen refueling stations for the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics. Why the oil companies are so keen on hydrogen? Because a future hydrogen economy offers the chance to prolong the tenability of their business models and can also use part, partly their existing infrastructure for fossil fuels to use hydrogen. And also for the Asia listed companies, there are already more than 150 Asia listed companies who are involved in hydrogen uh, from upstream, like the uh, winter and uh, solar companies, for example, Longji, like the number one in market evaluation right now in the world in solar industry, and but also to the midstream, the uh, fuel cell manufacturing or components manufacturing and to the downstream, the automakers and some chemical or industry players. So it is uh, estimated that from January to July of this year, the total investment into hydrogen industry in China have been beyond 250 billion RMB yuan. And the most of them have been invested by the SOEs and the listed companies. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk too much about policy and planning because there isn't a specific uh, central planning or policy spe specifically about hydrogen yet. So, but it's, it's, it's said that the, the, the top design or top planning on hydrogen industry will be coming out very soon. However, uh, I think as we all know, like we Chinese, we love to cross rovers by feeding the stones. So we, we, we love to do pilot schemes. So for, for uh, it has been all the cases like uh, the carbon market, we, we have done pilot regimes and for electric vehicles, we also have done some pilot city programs uh, back in uh, 2010 or uh, 10 years ago. So for, for the uh, hydrogen fuel cell, it's, it's, it's a similar story, but uh, the central government, firstly, they have three demonstration city clusters to subsidize or to reward the hydrogen development and the fuel cell vehicles. So they are actually the most industrialized uh, city clusters in China, which are the Pearl River Delta, uh, the Long River Delta centered in by Shanghai, and the Pan Bohai area, uh, which is Beijing, Tianjin, and the Hebei. So these city clusters are the first batch of demonstration city clusters for hydrogen development. And the cities or provinces, they have published their own plans or targets to develop hydrogen. These targets, including uh, the uh, future uh, fuel cell vehicles, uh, and the hydrogen, sorry, the hydrogen refueling stations. And also some of these uh, uh, targets, including the skill of the industry uh, by cultivating some leading players. So for example, Shanghai, Shanghai has been setting a target, uh, which is 
by 2023, Shanghai will build 100 hydrogen refueling stations and will try to sell 10,000 fuel cell vehicles in Shanghai, mostly commercial vehicles, produce and sell. So uh, uh, the hydrogen, the upstream, the production of hydrogen. So for now, the production of hydrogen in China is not that much, it's, but it's already number one in the world. The production volume of hydrogen last year is about 33 million, something about 33 million tons of hydrogen. Uh, the, uh, the production methods of hydrogen are still uh, mostly related to traditional fossil fuels. For example, the coal gasification. Coal gasification has uh, occupied 60% of the total hydrogen produced in China. And then natural gas reforming, which is a uh, SMR, it occupies about like 19%. And then uh, the, uh, the industrial process byproducts, for example, the coke oven gas, uh, producing 18% 18 of total volume of the hydrogen. Uh, the water electrolysis, it's not, it's, less than 1%, which means it's very few that can be neglectable. So if we compare the different methods of hydrogen production in terms of their carbon footprint and the cost, then we may find the cleanest way that the current way of uh, hydrogen production in China is not that clean. And the carbon footprint, for example, the coal gasification carbon footprint is about like it's above 19 carbon dioxide equivalent kilo, kilograms per kilograms of hydrogen. And for it, grid power, if for water electrolysis uh, hydrogen production using grid power, it's a, it has the highest carbon footprint because China's grid power are mostly generated from coal-fired power plants. The, cleanest way of producing hydrogen should be uh, water electrolysis using renewable energy, for example, hydro and solar, or the traditional uh, fossil fuel hydrogen production, but with a carbon capture and utilization and sequestration. However, the cost will increase a lot if we add a CCUS onto the uh, hydrogen production. So if we compare the cost currently, the lowest cost of uh, hydrogen production. Yes, so uh, as, lo in the, do, uh, as long as uh, the renewable energy cost will be greatly reduced, the renewable hydrogen will be mainstream. And I would like to also share a very interesting opinion uh, from the perspective of a energy industry player, because uh, the hydrogen and ed the, the relationship between hydrogen and energy, it's very interesting. It's not only like hydrogen production from renewable energy, but also we can regard hydrogen as a very important source of energy. According to IEA, you can see the global map it's actually a cost comparison of green hydrogen production. So if we, if you can see the, so, um, yeah, there is a, a so-called impossible trinity in renewable energy, which means for three goals or three factors regarding energy, low cost, clean, safety, and stability, you cannot achieve the three simultaneously, it's called trilemma. So for now, they, they, uh, in China, the renewable energy has achieved low cost and clean, but it's not stable. That's under the current circumstances in terms of technical development. So it's the same thing. The biggest challenge for China to achieve the whole power sector decarbonization will be energy storage. That's why also this year we can witness a energy storage hype in China's capital market as well. But hydrogen is getting more and more recognized as a very good means of energy storage right now in China's energy industry. 
For example, offshore wind, this power to X has been more and more popular in all the offshore wind farms all over the world, not only China, but it has been already been demonstrated in Nordic countries. And also this year, the state grid, the NDRC and the state grid has announced a, a new mechanism or new model of developing renewable, the, this big gigawatt scale renewable energy basis in China. It's called Source Network Load Storage Integration, Integration Yuan Wang He Chu. That means you build, for, for, for example, in the Great West of China, which are uh, which there are very rich resources in wind and solar. You, previously, we, we only build renewable energy power plants, like solar or wind farms over there. But right now, in, under this new integration model, China will also move some industries, the baseload industries, to the renewable energy basis. That's, that will increase the energy source gen generation side and the consumption side, the load side. So water electro electrolysis for producing hydrogen is not only a very good you know, source of hydrogen for the downstream industries, but also a very good means of storage for the upstream renewable energy. And for the consumption of hydrogen, there are many possible applications of hydrogen, not only transportation. Although hydrogen firstly has gained its hype for as, as to fuel cell vehicles, that's in transportation sector. But another trend right now in China is that the first trend is hydrogen, not only as an of energy, but as energy. The second trend is hydrogen, not only in transporta transportation sector, but also application in more various sectors. For example, the heat and power for buildings, for industry, and also in some kinds of, in, in some of the intensive emission, emitting sectors, fixed steel refining and chemicals. But the current situation for hydrogen consumption in China, there is another mix. It's About 32% of the current consumption of hydrogen is in ammonia production. Ammonia, we, as we all know that ammonia is NH3. Nitrogen and hydrogen can produce ammonia. And then ammonia mostly, are mostly used in fertilizers. China is the number one country in fertilizer production. And about 27% in methanol production. Methanol, as we all know, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it can, it's, can also, it, it's, uh, it can be produced by a combination of carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And also uh, the third, the third uh, and hydrogen consumption sector is refining. So that's the current status of hydrogen consumption. As we can see, there is the, 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 in, the, in the application side, the demand for hydrogen today are widely in ammonia refining and methanol, but not enough. The, the hydrogen demand has not been enoughly incentivized in other sectors. That's a challenge in the future development of hydrogen industry. So if we look at the future, the prospect in about like 30 years, there is a global forecast and the China forecast. So the global forecast of hydrogen consumption in 2050 are, can be divided into four aspects. Consumption, green ammonium, the uh, synthetic fuels, and storage. So the transportation sector in this whole consumption mix is only a small portion of it. The similar forecast in China. In 2050, the biggest consumption sector will be of hydrogen will be in industry. It's about like 57%. Only 41%, 41% will be in transportation sector. I will elaborate the transportation sector in the next slide. And 2% in building sector and others. So if we look at hydrogen in transportation sector, 
there is a must that we need to compare the fuel cell vehicles versus electric vehicles because the newest, the, the latest st statistics is that uh, since July of this year, every month, the, the, the new uh, the sales of new cars every month, it's over 20%. The electric vehicles, sales of electric vehicles have already been over 20% of whole sales of new cars in China. Well, previously it's a target in 2025, which means we have achieved this 2025 target in 2021, four years ahead. So electric vehicles has gained great popularity now in China, especially in the Z gener generation Z, the, the young people. So in, compar in comparison with electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles, I've noticed that one audience have asked that question. Yes, it, it, it was a study about two years ago that I have done for a local municipality that fuel cell vehicles will gain uh, fueled by hydrogen will gain more potentials, not in passenger vehicles, but in commercial vehicles. The commercial vehicles may include heavy duty trucks, cargoes and buses. So if we, we can, if we look at this uh, cost, cost, process, uh, cost of comparison between fuel cell vehicles and electric vehicles in four different kinds of vehicles, then we can see that for passenger vehicle, the two kinds of vehicles may gain similar cost in 2050 or latest 2045. However, for heavy duty trucks, cargoes and buses, the fuel cell vehicles can gain similar cost effectiveness by 2030, around 2030. That's why the current electric uh, fuel cell vehicles sales in China uh, up to now, it's no less than 10,000 vehicle, fuel cell vehicles up to now, accumulated sales. However, accumulated sales of electric vehicles have already in China have already over, over 5 million electric vehicles. So because the passenger vehicles, they have already been spreaded in uh, the electric vehicles. So the, the, the in infrastructure, I mean, the charging facilities also has been almost well established in China. So this, uh, to, avoid, to avoid the waste of existing electric vehicle infrastructure, to avoid a double repeated investment into new infrastructure, I think for passenger, the, the fuel cell vehicles should focus on development in the commercial vehicles, specifically in long distance, uh, heavy duty trucks, cargoes and buses. And the energy application in industry, it's also gained great recognition and focus uh, attentions since last year in China. The many industrial tycoons have been investing in direct application or utilization of hydrogen. For example, the steel sector. The steel sector might be the first act, uh, acting uh, emitting sector to emission, emitting industry to, to, to adopt hydrogen direct use. It's mainly uh, in the iron making process to use hydrogen as a direct reductant instead of natural gas or coke. Uh, sorry, some of my slides are, still, are, are, are remaining in Chinese. So I hope that uh, the, most of the audience may read in Chinese. So if we uh, compare the carbon footprint per ton of steel using different kinds of iron making and steel making, we can see the traditional steel making, uh, the carbon footprint is about 2.1 ton of e carbon dioxide equivalent per ton of steel making. But if we use the DRI, the direct reducing iron, uh, if we use natural gas and the, uh, the EAF, if we, we, if we use natural gas DRI plus EAF, the carbon footprint will be reduced to about 0.6 ton carbon dioxide equivalent. But if we use green hydrogen DRI plus EAF, the carbon footprint of steel making can be reduced to zero. That means 
there is a possibility of, to achieve zero carbon or net zero emission in steel sector. And green chemical, in green chemical, it's more like a switch instead of a substitution. The switch from traditional, because for some kinds of the chemical industry, like the ammonia production, methanol production, or some, some, some sectors in, in refining, in refineries, they, they have already greatly used uh, hydrogen as an industry feedstock. Uh, like I've already, yes, in ammonia, methanol, and refining, the currently three most uh, sectors consume, consuming hydrogen. But if we combine this map, uh, this mix with the production mix, we can find like also more, uh, almost 100% of the hydrogen they are using right now are from traditional fossil fuels. So it's, a, it's more like a switch from traditional fossil energy, hydrogen, fossil fuel energy to the new green renewable hydrogen to reduce their carbon footprint. And then, and then the uh, hydrogen enriched compressed the natural gas it actually expands the, the application of hydrogen into more industrial sectors. And also fuel cell based combined heating and power. It's not only in industry, but can also be used in building sectors and hydrogen boilers and furnaces. There are already some demonstration projects in domestic ch China and overseas to test the post uh, the, the, uh, the feasibility both in technology and commercialization of hydrogen burners and furnaces, furnaces uh, as a substitute of traditional furnaces, furnace and boilers. For example, uh, this is a, it's, it's, a, it's a test project of Tissum Group in steel R, in hydrogen DRI. And this one, this picture is in China, it's in Ningxia. It's a, it's a Ningdong, the, the East Ningxia. It's traditionally, it's a coal chemical. It might be one of the biggest coal chemical bases in China, but right now it has been switched to one of the biggest hydrogen chemical bases. It's, it, that's a switch that I have already mentioned. So uh, for some of the prospects in future development of China's hydrogen industry. The first prospect is um, economies of skill. We know that China is very good at manufacturing. <laughs> so for, for like China is, has a, the, the most best established supply chain in the world. And we can achieve lowest manufacturing costs by this, uh, you know, this well-established uh, supply chain and our mass production in uh, to achieve the, the economies of scale. So, uh, we are very certain that electroly the electrolyzer cost will be fall very rapidly in the coming decade as production scales up. So, the, the forecast is, uh, the electrolyzer cost will be reduced by 60 to 80% in the next 10 years with not only technology advancement, but increasing economies of scale. And uh, the, uh, the current uh, mainstream or, or the major technologies behind electrolyzers are alkali and PEM, uh, PEM. But in China, mm, I think, uh, for the next 10, at least 10 years, uh, I think the, the mainstream, the, the, the major, the, the, major, the biggest, the mostly used use, use method or to produce uh, to, for, for water electrolysis will still be alkali. And uh, some industry tycoons who are very good at mass production have already been joining in this game. For example, Longji, Longji just recently in, in, this, in this July announced their Manufacturing base in Wuxi. It's a wholly, uh, it's it's a, it's a manufacturing base wholly focusing on uh, electrolyzers, alkali, alkali electrolyzers. So why Longji? Uh, you know, uh, Longji. We all know that it has reduced the cost of solar PV greatly 
in the last 10 years. So with their experience and the best practice, practices in mass production, I'm, uh, I'm very confident that companies, the Chinese companies like Longji will achieve the best econo economies of skill in the world. Another, another prospect is uh, the green hydrogen trees. Uh, we, we know that electricity is a very, it's, it's dependent, it's highly dependent on, on geographic sites because uh, transmission will be, will, will, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to transmit uh, the electricity from China to Europe because the transmission line will be so long and costly. However, by using this uh, method to transform renewable energy into green hydrogen and then maybe green ammonium or other carriers to better tra transport hydrogen. The world can achieve a global green hydrogen trade instead of other kinds of energy trade. That's literally, it's trading electricity. So for China, because we have the biggest installation capacity of wind and hydro uh, and solar in the world, the renewable energy, we have the biggest production of renewable electricity in the world. So in after, after, after self, a self-sufficiency of green hydrogen, we can also explore the potentials of exporting green hydrogen to our neighboring countries like Japan, Korea, and Singapore, because the countries like Japan and Korea, Korea, they have very dedicated commitment or target in hydrogen consumption or a, hydro, a, a green hydrogen transition, but limited by their areas of lines or other you know, conditions, they have very limited supply, domestic supply of green hydrogen. So they need to count on imports of green hydrogen. Here shows some figures. For example, by 2030, Japan commits to, eat, to, 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 to consume uh, 0.3 million tons of green hydrogen. By 2050, commits a 10 million tons of green hydrogen. Then the biggest, the, this, this enormous, huge gap between self-production and consumption will be amended by imports. Similar stories for Korea. So my last slide will be my own specialty, carbon market. So we also predict that uh, the, the rising carbon market in China will be a very strong stimulus for hydrogen development. Uh, in, on July 16 of this year, China officially launched its nationwide cap and trade program. So as we, all, as we know that uh, starting from 2013, China has a regional pilot cap and, cap and trade programs in seven, firstly seven and then eight regions, including uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, Chongqing, Guangdong, Hubei, Shenzhen, and Fujian. But it's a pilot stage. So starting from this year, we have already officially gone into, entered into this nationwide unite, unified carbon market stage. So the first sector to be included in this cap and trade scheme is coal-fired power plants. Uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, yes, it's power generation from fossil fuels. But there are two different schemes in this carbon market. One is One. Cap and it's mandatory. Um, the, the, the products traded in this cap and trade scheme is called CEA, China Emission Allowances, freely uh, allocated, allocated for free to these emitters. Another scheme is an offset program. In China, we call it a CCER. It's China Certified Emission Reductions. So all these emission reduction projects with certain methodologies can be developed into carbon assets. It's Chinese carbon asset is CCERs, which means they are to some extent will be subsidized by carbon market. So 
the green hydrogen substitution or switch has great potentials of carbon dioxide abatement that can also be developed as carbon assets and then treated in China's carbon market. So, uh, so the, the latest carbon price, it's a CEA price, it's in Chinese, but the latest carbon price in China, it's about 42 to 45 RMB yuan per ton of CO2 equivalent. I'm not sure if you know about the European carbon price, that's the EUA, the European Union allowances. The EUA price has already been above 60 euros. So there is a big price gap between China and EU and other countries who have carbon markets. So we all, the, the, the market has, has, has achieved a consensus that in the next five to 10 years, the carbon price in China will be increased a lot. So uh, on the right bottom, it's a prediction. It's a, a, a study by Tsinghua University about China's carbon price. So it says that by 2050, China's carbon price will be above $100 per ton of CO2 equivalent. The current study also showed that the financial cost of switch from the traditional fossil hydrogen to renewable hydrogen have already been very close to the current sale to carbon market price of EU, that's the EU, EU ETS price. So we have the confidence that as the carbon prices of China increase by the time, the profitability of China's green hydrogen production will also be greatly subsidized by the carbon uh, asset program. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> uh, my time has been very perfectly managed. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have uh, enough time, so I've already asked you the two questions. I hope that you can answer them to me, and then later on I will report to all the other participants afterwards. Okay. Now, okay. Okay. You might you might go back to uh, make another speech. Uh, I guess you are in Chongqing, right? I know. I'm in Zhengzhou. Well, you're Zhengzhou. But Susan told me she she is in Chongqing, so I thought you are also in uh, in, in Chongqing. Okay, you are Zhengzhou. Fine. You go back to deliver your other speech, and in the meantime, I will ask Thomas to talk. Okay, bye bye. Yeah. and uh, I will share the slides with uh, Dominic and the uh, organizers or all the audience who didn't catch up with my slides. Okay. Okay, I do that. I do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.